The second reading is from Luke chapter 13 and it's verses 1 to 9. Now there were some present at that time who told Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. <coughs> Jesus answered, Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered this way? I tell you no, but unless you repent, you too will all perish. All those 18 who died when the tower in Siloam fell on them, do you think that they were more guilty than all the others living in Jerusalem? I tell you no, but unless you repent, you too will all perish. Then he told this parable. A man had a fig tree growing in his vineyard, and he went to look for fruit on it, but did not find any. So he said to the man who took care of the vineyard, For three years now I've been coming to look for fruit on this fig tree, and haven't found any. Cut it down. Why should it use up the soil? Sir, the man replied, leave it alone for one more year and I'll dig around it and fertilise it. If it bears fruit next year, fine. If not, then cut it down. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. It's the first time I've had to be dressed before I get over here. <laughs> but uh, can I well add my welcome to, to that of Trina, to, to the family and uh, it's good to see uh, Dustin's baptism. It's the first time I've ever seen anybody do two lengths of the pool <laughs> after being uh, baptised. But um, if it's uh, any encouragement to him, I too was baptised here. So he could too could be standing here very soon, being dressed like I was. <laughs> my, my name is Mark. I'm a member of the congregation here and privileged to spend uh, the morning with you and sharing God's word with you, God's word that was just read to us. I wonder what your idea of heaven is. Is it all the family being round at the house? Maybe you've got a bit of a party after the uh, baptism today, if not, or if you have, I'll uh, wait for my invite, but um, <laughs> enjoy. Maybe it's, your idea is relaxing on a Mediterranean beach. Remember those going away for holidays? Maybe that's your idea of heaven. Maybe it's a walk in the mountains. Or maybe it's, it's wolves hanging onto a two-goal lead. <laughs> My idea of heaven is, uh, is a mixture of the above. But as a Christian, our definition of heaven is eternity with God. Whatever that may look like. To be in the presence of the Creator God forever. That's what, as a Christian, we believe heaven is. And the last book of the Bible, Revelation, gives us a picture of what heaven may look like. Revelation chapter 21, verse 4 reads, He will wipe every tear from their eyes, and there will be no more death, no more sorrow, no more crying, no more pain. All these things are gone forever. Doesn't that sound fantastic? The alternative, separation from God and all that's good. But there's something that gets in the way of spending this wonderful eternity with God. And the Bible calls it sin. We might call it doing the wrong thing, thinking the wrong thing, saying the wrong thing. I wonder if any of you are old enough to remember a TV series with Ronnie Corbett called Sorry. Do you remember that one? He played a character that was constantly apologising. And Sorry is what we're going to be talking about today. Not in a light-hearted sitcom kind of way, but from a biblical perspective. It's literally the difference between eternal life with God and eternal separation from Him. 
So what's our Bible reading saying to us about that today? Let's just pray as we ask God to reveal it to us. Lord Jesus, thank you for your word, for the way it challenges us and the way it feeds us. Help us to study it thoroughly, to seek to understand what you're telling us through it, and to adjust our lives accordingly. As we look at this passage this morning, we ask that you will open our eyes to see what you're telling us. Open our ears to hear your word, and open our hearts as we look to live it out in the days, weeks and months ahead. For Jesus Christ's sake. Amen. My niece, a little bit older than Dustin, but my niece has this thing where if she asked to say sorry, she will say, sorry, not sorry. Have you ever come across that before? Sorry, not sorry. She said the words, but she's not really meant it. She's 35. <laughs> <laughs> she should know better. She does it in humour, but I wonder how many of us do that with God. Sorry, not sorry. We're sorry for what we've done, or thought, or said, but there's no real intent when it comes to not doing it again. Elton John said, sorry seems to be the hardest word. Sometimes when we apologise, we say, I'm sorry you felt that way, rather than sorry for what we've actually done. Sometimes we may be tempted to look around at others a little judgmentally and think they're so much worse than us. Our little sin is not so bad after all. Jesus is very clear in this reading that we just had from Luke, that we should repent, we should be truly sorry, regardless of how bad we think our sin is, and that things should change going forward. And I think there are two key things to understand from that Luke reading that we had. First one is it says we should all repent, we should all say sorry. And the second thing is that apology should make a difference. So we should all repent. In our reading we hear a story of some Galileans who died a horrific death and also the tower that fell on some people and killed them in a place called Siloam. Those that were with Jesus at the time asked if the people that died were particularly bad people because of what had happened to them. Because it was the view at the time that bad things happen to bad people. But Jesus was very clear in his response. In verses 3 and 5 in our reading, Jesus says, I tell you no. They were not worse people. Jesus is saying, don't concern yourselves about what others are doing, but be mindful of where we need to be sorry, when we get things wrong. So the bad things that happened to them wasn't because they're worse than anyone else. And we read in another passage of the Bible, in Romans chapter 3, it tells us that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So as we look at this passage, it's sobering to remind ourselves that we're in no position to look around and judge others. Let's take away that finger pointing right up front. That judgment belongs to God alone. Punishment for all sin is the same. Jesus said in verse 3 and 5, unless you repent, unless you say sorry, you too will all perish. And by saying that, Jesus leveled the playing field. They were all sinful, and unless they repented, they too would perish. And what he's saying is there's no automatic connection with particular sins and particular suffering, but there is a direct link with sin and eternity without God. Another passage in Romans 6.23 is very clear that the wages of sin is death. Now God is desperate for us to walk with him. His love for us is absolute. But the devil comes between God and us in the form of sin. It drives a wedge between us. 
Sinners, it says, will not share eternal life with God. In that heaven that we spoke of earlier, eternity with the Creator God, in a place more wonderful than we can ever imagine. Unless, and here's the kicker, unless we repent. We have a loving and forgiving God. So there is a way through this if we say that we're sorry. And another chapter or another book of the Bible, Acts chapter 3, verse 19. Let me quote that to you. Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. Repentance is something we tend to do when we first turn to God. But we're imperfect beings. We mess up regularly. We make a horlicks of things. And we need to continually say that we're sorry. Remember, it's sin that drives a wedge between us and God. He wants us to repent and come back to him. And a baptism service is a great reminder to all of us. Parents, godparents, all of us are asked if we repent of our sins. We confirm that we have. Remember, God is our judge. Have we truly repented or have we said, sorry, not sorry? When our apology is genuine, God always accepts it. I've just finished reading a book about cycling. It's a little hobby of mine, reading and cycling that is, but not at the same time. And this is a guy who cycled around the coast of the UK. Uh, it took him ages, it was several thousand miles. Um, but when he was in northern Scotland, you know these little signs as you go into villages that tells you the name of the village? On the back of the signs, on the way out of these villages in northern Scotland, it had got the words, hasten ye back. They want them to return, hasten ye back. That's what God wants for us, for us to hasten back to him, to say sorry and come back to him. The Greek word for repentance is metanoia, which actually means a change of mind, a change of direction, a desire not to repeat it. So it's not my niece's sorry, not sorry. It's an absolute and utter about turn. I wonder if you can think of a time when you got something horribly wrong. That may be easier for me than for, for some of you, but it may not be deliberate, but it was horrible. You got it wrong. I want to share a personal example of that. Uh, it was a few years ago, Christmas morning. Picture it, if you will. Early Christmas morning, the turkey went into the oven. I thank my wife for that. Got up with the lark, put the turkey in the oven, and... Uh, on went the oven as we got ready for church. This is the bit that I can't fully explain to you, but on the way to church, well, as we were leaving the house to come to church, I noticed the oven was on and turned it off. I, I, I really can't explain. This is a few year, years ago, but it, it was a genuine accident. It was just as you walk past the oven, you know, oh, someone's left the oven on. <coughs> Turned it off. And we got back from church a couple of hours later, you know, when you expect that beautiful smell of cooking turkey at Christmas dinners, just ready to be, to be served. Walk through the front door, nothing. No smell, not even that little warmth coming from the oven that you often get, nothing at all. I can't tell you how apologetic I was. <laughs> Have you met my wife? <laughs> there was no effort to blame anyone else. I knew as soon as we got back and, and she said, someone's turned the oven off. I, I knew it was me. It wasn't, well, I, I don't know who did that. <laughs> I was so sorry to all those whose Christmas I had delayed. Not spoiled completely, but delayed. I was genuinely sorry. I can happily say that I've never done it since. And that is true repentance. Genuine, heartfelt, with the real intention of never doing it again. A famous example of something 
similar but far more um, affected far more people was if you've ever heard of John Newton. John Newton was a guy who worked in the slave trade many years ago. He was a re re worked and, and encouraged the slave trade and he had a change of heart. He became a Christian and had such a change of heart that he went on to work alongside William Wilberforce in outlawing slave trading. And he wrote some banging hymns as well. There's one called Amazing Grace, if you've heard of that, that was written by John Newton. And we're going to sing that a little bit later. But when we sing it, note the words. We sing it, familiar words, but it's about his repentance, his change of heart. Amazing grace. But it was a complete and utter realisation of where he'd gone wrong and a change of direction. Every Sunday, when we come to church, we confess our sins to God and ask for his forgiveness. And this is absolutely what we need to do. But is our confession genuine? Is it heartfelt? Is it with the real intention of never doing it again? It should be. And what I'll do is encourage you not to wait until Sunday. Repent, say sorry to God at the time. 1 John 1 verse 9 reads, If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all wrongdoing. We're not worthy of that forgiveness, but by dying on the cross, Jesus paid the price for our sins. Now, I'm sure like me, you all like a freebie. I went to a wedding uh, a few months ago and went to the bar to buy a drink for, for my family, well, for one for me as well, but for my family, only to find out it was a free bar. Now that is a good day in anyone's, uh, in anyone's week. But I went to pay for the drinks and the barman said to me, it's okay, it's paid for. And that's what it's going to be like on the final day of reckoning. For those who've truly repented, who've truly said sorry for their wrongdoing, Jesus will effectively say to God, it's okay, I've paid for him, I've paid for her. What an amazing God we have. But what difference should that genuine heartfelt sorry make? So briefly to our second point, our apology should make a difference. Jesus used a parable of a fig tree in our reading. And fig trees are often planted in vineyards because apparently it was good for the grapes. But the parable goes that the fig tree had been sitting there in the vineyard for a few years producing no fruit. Now God, that's represented by the vineyard owner in this story, was all for cutting it down, freeing up the soil for the vines. But Jesus, represented by the gardener in the parable, wanted a chance to tend to it, to give it one last chance to be fruitful. In other words, Jesus is giving us a chance to say sorry and come to him. How do we know the fig tree is a fig tree? It produces figs, it produces fruit. You can see them. How do we know that someone has truly repented? They produce fruit. You can see it from their actions. So our genuine repentance should make a difference that people can see. And there's another story in the Bible that helps us with our understanding of that. You might have heard of Zacchaeus. He was a very small man. Not that there's anything wrong with that. But he was a very small man and he was a very bad man. Um, he was a tax collector and he was a dodgy tax collector who kept, kept a lot of money for himself. And he owed lots of people lots of money, but an apology as well. And Jesus visited him. And after that visit, Zacchaeus said, here, and, and I quote from this, here and now, I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I've cheated anybody out of anything, I'll pay back four times the amount. Right there was the fruit, the evidence of a true apology. Are we bearing fruit for God's kingdom? Or are we just like the fig tree, just using up the soil? Think back this last week, at a time where you needed to apologise for something, where I needed to apologise for something. Maybe we said something a little harsh to our partner, 
Maybe we took a friend for granted. Maybe we said something in anger that we later regretted, or didn't. The passage is saying, don't just feel bad about it, change. 2 Corinthians 7 verse 10 in the New Testament says, Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret. But worldly sorrow brings death. We're in a time of Lent at the moment, and maybe Lent is a good time to focus on this. Rather than giving something up, or maybe as well as doing that, focus your mind on three things we've just spoken about. Number one, we are sinful people and need to say sorry to God and mean it. The second thing, remember the price that Jesus paid for our forgiveness. He died for you and for me. Have you ever really acknowledged it and asked him to walk with you? We all need his forgiveness so that on the final day we can hear those priceless words. His sins, her sins have been paid for. Welcome to paradise. And the third thing, make sure our apology makes a difference and that our actions reflect it. Shall we pray? Lord Jesus, if we've never truly acknowledged you before, may we welcome you into our lives and be genuinely sorry for our wrongdoing. As we continue to walk with you, help us to demonstrate this relationship with you through Christian fruitfulness, to show we are truly sorry. And even when we continue to get it wrong, thank you that you are a forgiving God. You love us to come back to you and we can never say sorry too many times. Thank you that when we say sorry, you forgive us absolutely. That is truly amazing grace. In this time of Lent, may this be our focus day by day. In his name we pray. Amen.